Hi CMSRU, this is CMSR We. I'm Bo Choi, an M1 from Cooper Medical School of Rowan University, and I'm joined by my three guests. My name is Damien Alpheus. I'm an M1 as well at Cooper Medical School. Uh, my name is Constantine Pella. I'm an M1. And I'm Dr. Lee Evan Bryant, the Director of Curriculum and Student Development here at the Cooper Medical School of Rowan University. Great. Thank you guys for joining me today. Today we're going to talk about a pre-matriculation program called UMED that stands for Urban Medical Education and Development. Just to start us off, Dr. Bryant, can you just give us a brief overview of UMED and its goals and its mission in a nutshell? Okay, I'll try. <laughs> so UMED, the concept of UMED actually um, began back probably in 20. 15, maybe the end of 2015, moving into the beginning of 2016, at which Dr. Mitchell Williams had approached my supervisor, who is Dr. Perlis, about you know the development of a program to help underrepresented students to get them acclimated into medical school. And we had had numerous meetings just about you know, name, planning, and the concept of the actual structure of UMED was uh, developed by Dr. Perlis. And she knew, since I was working with her, she knew my background, and I have a strong background in summer bridge programs. And so because of that, you know, she put together the plan, and then, you know, it was my duty to help operationalize it. UMED was originally all funded through um, a HRSA grant. With that HRSA grant, I think the funding was up for three years. So after the grant ends, then it's up to, and the onus is on then the institution to continue. And so when we were having those initial meetings, um, the one thing we wanted to really do is give the student the experience of the medical school before they actually got here. But the one component that, and, and by the way, Prior to you met, I really had little experience with student connection. Students would come to me not very frequent. And so one of the things that my supervisor wanted was for me to get a little bit more exposure to student contact. In the beginning, most of my student contact was regarding appeals. When students needed to appeal a grade, then they came and see me. Other than that, I didn't have much contact with students. So. The UMAP program was a way to really spark a different connection with students. And so one of the things she built in, and knowing my background, was the whole motivational series. And so um, that certainly resonated with me. And because of that, it truly invested myself deeply into the program. Now, granted, I had to run the entire program, but to know that I had dedicated time with the students certainly appeased me with regard to the program. So in the beginning, in the first year we did it, you know, having the motivational sessions, I planned the orientation, the scheduling of the faculty, the work with we, that what we did with Blackboard, all that was all the things I did. Again, I operationalized the program, you know, through that program. Program, we've seen numerous students, you know, uh, attend medicine, and um, really, because of you met, may have seen something that would have started out as a little challenging, allowed them to have a better grasp of what they could expect into medical school. Mm -hmm. That's a great description of all the broad missions and goals of UMED. Just to clarify, CMSRU has a lot of programs over the summer for many different populations. And for UMED in particular, it's for students who are already admitted into Cooper Med School and then are invited to come a month early to just, like Dr. Bryan said, acclimate themselves to this environment and in some cases uh, just review over some of the uh, curriculum, but mostly to just find a community where we know we could go back to during the entire medical school journey. Would you would you say that's I would say that's certainly accurate and I think 
one of, again, the goals, mission, is to also have the student find connections. We know that research shows that underrepresented populations are generally first-generation populations, and whether you're in undergrad, master's program, doctoral program, being a first-generation student, you always struggle with a connection. You always struggle with where do I fit in? And so the UMET program was that link to help you to see, hey, here's faculty, here's administration, here's how you can get connected in. And speaking as a first generation, I know how important that is to be able to say, hey, you know, um, during these four weeks, I had a chance to speak with the dean. I had the chance to speak with the um, associate deans and the assistant deans of the college. It's very important because now you have a connection. Now you have a link. You have a link with the students who are part of your cohort, but you also have a link to some key people in the institution that is a valuable resource to you as the student. And I, I would say that all rings true as a former UMED student myself. The other you're to never former. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're just a complete alumni. Yes, I call you all you medians, but go ahead. So Constantine and Damien, who who were also in the program with me this year, they're here to talk more about their experiences. And I think what sets them apart from my background is that they were already kind of familiar with CMSRU as an institution. They attended the Pulse program, which is um, a summer program for Undergrad. undergraduates. Yeah. yeah. So take it away, you guys. Could you just talk a little bit about academic background and your experience in UMED and kind of your experience in Pulse as well? Okay. okay. Sure. So, yeah, I'll start it off. So I was undergraduate at Rowan University, so I got the opportunity to uh, join the Pulse program through word of mouth uh, throughout the school, because Rowan is also affiliated, of course, with Cooper Medical School. So that, just doing the Pulse allowed me to get a good feel for the building itself. So coming into UMed, I knew the area. I knew what to expect of the area, and I had a good idea of what was where in the school. So the main thing I took out of it was basically, you know, this is occurring. We did UMed before we started the school year. So I wanted to get acclimated with everything. I wanted to get a taste of what med school was like and also for some of the content. And uh, I found that absolutely got some of the best head starts and information from this program, uh, especially regarding OSCEs and talking to patients and also some things, similar things that we're learning in FMP. I mean, the first week we talked about taking history, physical, chief complaint. That's something we already did in the UMED program through an OSCE practice mm -hmm. with a standardized patient. Mm -hmm. So that definitely gave me like a nice head start and a good feeling. I'm Damien again. So I went to undergrad at LaSalle University. So I did not, I, the way I heard about the post program initially was just a random email that came through my email box. And I applied because I needed something to do that summer. And then I learned more about CMSRU through the post program, was lucky and fortunate enough to apply to CMSRU and be accepted. And then I did the UMED program in July. So I think the one, how are you having a familiarity of how good the post program was and the opportunities provided through that like summer bridge program really inspired me to do the UMED program because I know like the quality of like CMSRU's summer bridge programs and then the Con, like getting acclimated and knowing like what medical school is like but I think the one thing that really can't be understated is just like having that experience to talk to our TAs where Ariane and Joey that really were really good in like telling us what medical school is like because so they're M2s now and they were able to tell us what medical school was like how they went through M one year and they both went through it very differently like Joey talked about like how she went to lecture and like her note taking strategy which was different than Ariane who didn't go to lecture and use more Anki compared yeah. to Joey. So just knowing that there's not just one fixed way of doing medical school, because a lot, like, and I think Dr. Brian alluded to earlier, um, me, myself, I'm a first generation um, college student, first generation medical school student. I don't know many people who go to medical school besides the people I've been in contact with mm -hmm. through college. There's not like a family member that I know that went through medical school or like a close friend that I know before college that went through medical school. So getting that experience to know that there's more than just one way to approach because 
you can you can read a lot of stuff online about how it's done, but until you like hear from a person that's actually went through it, went through it at the yeah. same medical school, they, it really resonates to you. And then the opportunities you met provided through the OSCE training that Constantine talked about was really valuable because I've never had an experience with a standardized patient yeah, before. Yeah. Uh, and then even shadowing in the um, the the Cooper Run Clinic was very like seeing how it runs, how it functions because like I've heard of the Cooper Run Clinic, but I never saw how it runs or like how it is inside and like the dynamic. And I know the dynamic was a little different when we were there because it was only M threes. So again, we don't have to feel like how it's going to be with like M twos and M ones in there. But just seeing how it runs, how an M three presents to an attendant was a very rewarding experience. I just want to touch base a little bit about Pulse here at the Cooper Medical School Run University. We're very collaborative and you know these gentlemen talked about the post program of which I actually taught some workshops in yes. and so has my staff uh, Jill Farrar and also Colleen Devlin and uh, for the post program I um, actually do a workshop on professionalism mm-hmm. and also interviewing skills uh-huh. and you know through that sometimes students then come see me for one on one students who actually came to me for a one-on-one consultation. How did that and go? <laughs> All right. So, Dr. Brian Wait, is okay. a, He got in. Yes. He got in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. <laughs> yes. Dr. Brian is a interviewing wizard. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, I I highly believe I wouldn't have been here without the advice what Dr. Brian gave to me. Um, so he had a workshop in Pulse about interviewing, and sometimes the workshops they can be hit or miss. Sometimes you never know with the presenter, but. By far the best workshop, and I'm not just saying that because he's here. I'm definitely not. <laughs> I've told have people. Said. Others have he's said. In arms reach. Yeah, <laughs> he is in arms reach. <laughs> and intimidating, clearly. But, yeah. <laughs> but the interviewing skills, just to know how to present stuff and really feel comfortable. I was someone who was very shy at first. From my freshman year of college, I really didn't talk to many people, and I was very shy, very timid of talking to people. And I think that really came with being a first generation college student, not knowing what to expect. And then I did grow out of my shell through Pulse and through friends I made at LaSalle University. But then interviewing was something I've never did. I only interviewed for like one job in my life that was, and it was a, it was like a summer camp job. They clearly wanted to hire me, and like my interview was terrible. Like <laughs> they only hired me. They saw my like I was a college student. They need people that. But I like I left the interview. I was like that was a te- I, I was absolutely terrible. So I knew interviewing was a sh- a struggle of me and then so I had my first interview with Dr. Bryant and it was terrible <laughs> it was absolute garbage they, I think they would have threw me out of the building <laughs> like the, how was it garbage like, um I stuttered a lot oh. I was very low with my voice um Bad. I was yeah a lot of ums <laughs> um just <laughs> <laughs> And very indecisive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So one of the things that I um, do when I and I know we're a little off topic, but one okay. of the things I do is um, is um is <laughs> help students with two things. One, uh, being very clear with what they want to project. Mm-hmm. Uh, often people give too much information, yes. and that'll get you chopped yep. because you share way too much in. A few students have done it. The other thing I try and do is to get people to understand they want to see that person who they're interviewing, the interviewer, as, as a family member, as some kind of connection, so you can have a conversation <laughs> rather than an interview. And when you start thinking in terms like that, it changes the dynamic of the conversation because you're, you're feeling like you're with a friend or something. Mm-hmm. So I get the students to feel more comfortable with the interviewer mm-hmm. rather than seeing it as an interview. So with me, with regard to some of the summer bridges that I did, I used to work at the Community College of Philadelphia and in TRIO, Student Support uh, Services Program. And TRIO is a federally funded program for first-generation low-income students. And we received a grant in TRIO, our particular school, at which we had to create the summer bridge program. And so uh, because we had money and funding, I, like, I went berserk. I took the <laughs> students on. Uh, and granted, although the students were from and in Philadelphia, it had been years since they had seen some of the sights and sounds. So <laughs> we were able to take them to a lot of the historic places in Philadelphia, <laughs> then college tours and trips and all that kind of stuff. And I had the... Uh, 
responsibility of planning all that. I also, when I was at the Thomas Jefferson University, I ran actually two summer programs for high school students consecutively oh together. Wow. One was a program that was specific to first generation low income, but they were a part of this one institution, and it was actually to expose them to the various different health professions. The other um, program I ran was a program, and that program before the health professions one only had about seven, eight students, but then I also ran what was called the Summer Science at Jefferson program, and that program housed about 30 high school uh, juniors and seniors who um, attended the program, and that exposed them to the biomedical sciences, many of which wanted to be doctors. In fact, there is a student here who had came through my uh-huh. summer science program uh-huh. here now. Oh, wow. And then Ooh. we had Susanna and Samantha Colazzo, oh. the twins. They had come, they went to Brim uh-huh. High School. They had come through my summer science program. Uh-huh. So when I actually came here in 2015, they were like, at, at the time I wasn't Dr. Bryant, but they were like, hey, hey, you know. So it was very, it was so good to see some of my students actually yeah. here. They were yeah. part um, wow. I forget what class, but they actually were here and had graduated, I believe, two years ago. Wow. Um, so it was good to see them <laughs> in the program. That's awesome. Wow. Um, real quick, can I ask, how do you define first generation student? I ask because in my undergrad, we had separate categories for first in your family to go to college, mm-hmm. just ever. Right. And we also had first in your family to go to college in the United States, mm-hmm. which comes with its own challenges, right. I believe. So I'm Roland, the, in each school, well, in the federal government, it's very specific. So when I was with TRIO programs, first generation was neither parent has a bachelor's degree. So they could have gone to school, but, and as, but as long as they did not graduate with a bachelor's degree, you were considered first generation. Here at Rowan, they've adopted more so a philosophy of first generation is more on that perspective that you had said where you know your parents could have had a bachelor's degree from an international school but if they had not had received one here in the states then they you would be considered first generation mm-hmm. and at Rowan and some of those philosophies and things we've certainly adopted here since that's our main institution we actually celebrate first generation here on this campus I'm, I'm actually the connection cool. between Maine and here. Yeah. So there are programming that's happening there and we do some things here, but it's not as elaborate as it is down on Maine mm-hmm. campus. Mm-hmm. You know, based off mm-hmm. of you all's schedule. I asked because I was born in Korea and both my parents received college degrees in Korea, but when I was applying to schools in the US, I had really nothing to go off of. No one in my family had gone to pursue higher education in the United States, and no one in my family went to med school, I mean, at all. And so I found myself just trying to do as much as I could, and I was attending school in Korea, so I couldn't even go on like campus visits. Oh. So I felt like at a real loss, but when, even after I went to college, I just felt so paralyzed by imposter syndrome, by mm. feeling out of place. And I really wish there was a similar program that just tells you these are the resources. Yes, they are accessible. Yes, you have a seat at this place. And that's what I really love about UMED and the CMSRU missions in general. I, I had a question for Damien and Constantine. Since you guys did the Pulse program, did that influence your decision on where you went to medical school afterwards? Okay, I'll start off this time. So the Pulse program actually has these pathways, actually, and I was went through one of them. So there's, they had this no MCAT pathway. So I was going through some trouble and family issues at the moment. So I applied to the the, um, the no MCAT route to Cooper. And I did that also because I love the school and like getting it acclimated. I don't think I would have been able to confidently do that if I didn't do, of course, the Pulse program to be eligible for the program, but also be comfortable that Pulse, like CMSR actually believes in the mission because a lot of schools can talk it and can type up anything, but to actually live and believe the mission was something I saw that not only does the school and the faculty believe, but the students that are accepted here also believe in the mission. Yeah, 100%. I agree with Damien, too. The Pulse and also the human program together for me just kind of solidified at home here. Uh, and I noticed going to different interviews in different Pennsylvania, some in New York, 
I didn't get that same kind of home feeling. This this these this school offers you something. It, it cares about you, and that's something other schools don't really do. They want you to succeed. That's why they're getting you into the clinic as soon as possible. They want you to care about the community because it gives you a sense of who you are, you know, and, and it puts you in your place. So I found that immediately interesting during Pulse, and also the friends I made, the faculty I interacted with, was just it was just the obvious choice. This place cares about me, mm. and that's something I didn't feel anywhere else. Um, I applied something similar through with Damien. I did the MCAT route where you had to score a specific um, average. We'll not get into it because the MCAT's behind me. I'm not talking about the <laughs> uh, and a certain GPA, and then you get a guaranteed interview. But it's not it's not a guaranteed. No. You still no. gotta present yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. It's an interview, yeah, sure, but mm-hmm. so it's not it's not like a rope in, which I really yeah. like too. Yes, yeah, yeah. it still has to do mm-hmm. with you, and it still has to do with the type of person you are. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a misconception some people might have because they hear the word pipeline program mm. and they think, you know, this, this is this is a program that is unfair towards other applicants. But what you bring up is a really important mm-hmm. point that. The responsibility still falls on you. Oh, yes. And same with you, Med. Yeah. Like, yeah. it was a summer, it was a whole month before starting med school. Yeah. Let's you know, talk about you, Med. Yeah. Just, do you guys want to talk about what we did, the, like, day-by-day schedule, just to give, you know, someone who has never heard of the program what it is? Yeah, sure. Sure. So, mornings was uh, motivation with Dr. Bryant, which got deep, <laughs> very, very deep. <laughs> We learned things about ourselves and each other and uh, broke down barriers, which was, I think, really important to making a home here and also just kind of building bonds on friendships. Then afterwards, we had like a lecture, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. But every day. No, I think we had. It depends on the okay, ALGs. Yeah. No, it depends on the course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. In yeah. the beginning, yeah. you actually had all lectures. All lectures. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we did. Yeah. Well, but we, we kinda, a month ago, we don't remember. <laughs> 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 we kind of got an intro to ALG and how to set up an ALG, which was really good because I feel, even for us, our first day was we were sitting down with the case and they just leave it up to you. They say, mm-hmm. you, you guys figure it out. Yeah, and ALG, just real quick for those who don't know, CMSRU lingo, it stands for Active Learning Groups. Mm -hmm. And so you are placed in small groups and you are given a clinical case and your objective is to just dive in deeper, whether that means relating it back to the basic sciences or the other social, political, economical backgrounds can also come into play. So it's just a way for us to have a discussion about medicine Mm -hmm. and different environments. And go ahead, I just want to explain. No, yeah, and each each uh, as the week progresses, you get a little bit more about the case, maybe some lab results, and then some this and questions the patient may have. So it's really cool because it's like interactive. You're like feel like a doctor. Then we also have meetings with our learning specialists, tips on how to study, what to expect when you enter med school, a lot about wellness uh, and wellness plans because you know hard work good, and hard work fine, but first take care of head, right? And then we would end the day with either a trip to volunteering, service learning, a trip to the clinic, and also just practicing OSCE stuff, how to take histories and discussion. Yeah, and OSCE, I don't know what that stands for, but it's... <laughs> I forgot. You, you interact with a standardized patient. You, you interact yeah. with an yeah. actor patient. patient. So it's yeah. like a really good actor coming in. No, no Lito Caprio or anything like that, but... I don't know. My guy was a pretty good actor. He was a good actor. He was a good actor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give him a Grammy, but he was a good actor. Yeah. <laughs> Nomination. Not for music. I'm going to give him a Grammy anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So if I could just, so for the first two years of UMED, we ended UMED with students having to do presentations. And after the second year, moving into the third year of UMED, which would have been last year, we cut those presentations out and started this whole idea of having the uh, participants sit with, have, if you will, a last powwow with administration and stuff. But I am thinking about resurrecting and bringing back the presentation. So how the presentations work was you were randomly selected into a group, so you couldn't choose. <laughs> Random selection into a group. And <clears throat> each group would then have to present on an area, a topical area, 
that was part of UMAD. So there were students that had to present on motivation. There were students that had to present about the lectures. There were students that had to present about mm-hmm. learning support and service learning and yeah. then ambulatory. And so each group might have been given 45 minutes. And so, Whoa. yeah. Whoa. So, so I, I can't even talk that. And you were, you were able like to bring people. But if you go through the slide presentation and question and answer, yeah. it comes to it. So you can, maybe about half hour. But once you start getting into it, but in any case, two years ago, there was this conversation that I had with the group about presentations. Because one person in the group was deathly scared of having to present. Mm -hmm. And when we were going through, before we have the students present, we do a run through. And myself and the learning support team sits there and we give you some feedback on your, your dry run. And one person was, again, deathly scared. And so another person from UMED, you know, just really says, see, this is why we really shouldn't do these. You know, you're putting people, um, you're making people do things that they really don't want to do. And also, and so, of course, for me, everything's a teaching moment. And what's the one thing I always say to you all about UMED? I got a what? Break you, break you down, before build I can you build you up. Break you up. <laughs> and broken bus down, he did. And so, <laughs> you had seen broken down. So, in, in this particular group, I knew in the back of my mind for the first two years that come wild week, you're going to be in groups and have to present. So, everything that I had created for you, Matt, was really about getting you ready for what's to come. And I knew that after about eight weeks, bam, you're going to be presented Mm -hmm. in that ninth week. So I knew in the backdrop what I was doing. Of course, the students don't know. And so, you know, I had calmed the student down, calmed the other student down who was defensive, or not, I won't say defensive, but was very supportive of this other student. And I didn't explain to them why we need to do it, or then the reason is, but I just shared with them how important it is for us all. And I said to them, you never know when you're going to need to present. I said, you're pursuing medicine. You're going to have to always present. So I'm just preparing you. And I think that's the great thing about the UMET program is you all may not know going through how valuable it is until you actually start Mm -hmm. sitting and experiencing and then students come back oh dr brian i'm so glad you did this i'm so glad we did that (laughs) and that's what really you know going through i'm fine but what really fulfills me is a seeing you know my fourth years you know about to complete but then seeing how you all practically move through the curriculum based off of everything you learned in the UMED program. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mastermind, Dr. Brian. Duh. <laughs> Always waiting with an I told you so. That was a plan. <laughs> Without necessarily saying it. <laughs> it's all part of the plan. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's the process. <laughs> So we're going to wrap up in a bit. The last things I just wanted to say, just like your last thoughts on UMED in general, how you have personally benefited. Like I, I shared, my undergrad transition was really difficult for me because I didn't have a program mm-hmm. like that that really introduced me to this other world. Because once you're in higher education, it's really like a whole nother world, a whole oh, nother language. Yeah. You're expected to dress a certain way, talk a certain way. You are expected to take the initiative to reach out mm-hmm. to mentors or reach out to certain opportunities and if you don't you use it or you lose it that sort of thing what do you guys think yeah definitely if any uh students here or hopefully incoming students may be going through interviews here do the program if you get the chance it's 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 really influential and it does help out a lot especially your first couple years you'll see in your first week you'll see uh this program was absolutely uh and uh influential to me so and I uh, won't remember it for probably the rest of my life. Yeah, it was definitely influential. And I think the one big thing is don't, like, overshoot, like, the importance of, like, the people you meet through the program. And mm-hmm. I think that was something – I'm very much a person that doesn't see the benefits sometimes of, like, just interacting with people. I, I sometimes very much focus on how is this going to benefit me academically. But the benefit of getting to meet a group of people, getting to meet people yeah. that could be mentors, getting to meet, like – even meeting Bo, like great, like I'm not. I don't know if I'd have had this interaction with Bo if it wasn't for the UMed program. Yeah. So I think That's that true. that part cannot be understated. I think I, I think 
<laughs> it's interesting that you mentioned that because I think I didn't take advantage of that through the Pulse program. Yeah. I think I took more of advantage through this program, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to the faculty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Definitely reach out more. Yeah. Agree. Mm-hmm. Any last words? Though? So, for the first time ever, I had decided to actually join the group um, for their last. <laughs> uh, Oh. Which in of itself is eye opening, but uh, <laughs> the curve is good. Come on, <laughs> I think. It was the, good curve. And I, I, I had shared with one of the former UMed students that I actually did that. And I said, "Oh, that's great, Dr. Brian," and it was because it had given me an opportunity to be in amongst your presence without there being any structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that I'm going to, for the future, continue to do. And, uh, you know, UMED, again, was uh, supported and funded by the Office of Diversity and Community Affairs this year because Dr. Mitchell Williams just realized just how important Mm -hmm. it is. And so I... You know, if I could go across the country and just, you know, have you men programs, yeah. if you will, yeah. uh, I, you know, I would certainly love it. And I think because of what you had just said, Bo, just about the importance of having some kind of acclimation, especially for being an underrepresented first generation student, because uh, having a connection and support. And I'll real quickly share with you when I was uh, pursuing higher education. Back in 19... Mm-hmm. <laughs> when, because you know, when you're young, you need to get your parents' financial information. Oh, yeah. My parents are like, we're not giving you a thing. So oh, yeah. this whole road, the oh, start God. was completely on my own. Going to college, mm-hmm. I had to get up there all by myself because my parents did not understand higher ed. I was the first mm-hmm. in my family. Mm-hmm. And so because I know what happened and what it took for me, my journey has always been to help those who are like me so I can get them at least over one hurdle. Mm-hmm. If yeah. I had to jump 20, I at least want to get you over at least one, mm-hmm. and I can then get you over as many more as possible. Yeah, I don't think you can overstate the importance of mentorship and having someone like Dr. Brian who had gone through it all Without a program like UMED, you know, then in retrospect, then has us to guide through. Mm-hmm. We're very fortunate for that. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, that was today's episode. Thank you again for listening in. I'm Bo Choi. This is CMSR We, and we'll see you next week.